So there are two questions. So the first question is that some Jews they have naf sota, which the Orthodox Jews don't believe in it, and they don't have from them. If the mass sota is not zabiha, name of Allah is not taking, it's haram for us, whether the Orthodox do have it or don't have it. So we should determine whether the Jews they slaughter it in the Islamic manner. If you have a doubt, you cannot determine, then have the Muslim meat that's safer. If you can determine, and if it follows the rules of the Sharia, you are allowed to have. Regarding a second question. Shouldn't we support the Muslims? How long are we going to have the food of the people of the book, etc.? Shouldn't we purchase from the Muslims, etc.? Sister, I agree with you. But if you ask me that can a person buy food in the Ahle Kitab or the Hindu shop, I said as long as it is halal, it is allowed for you. I won't say it is haram. But if you ask which is preferable, I would say yes. It is preferred that we give business to our Muslim brothers. Preferable. I won't say it is haram to have the food. If it falls within the Sharia level, it's not haram. But if you ask me, is it preferred to buy from a non-Muslim shop or a Muslim shop? I would say it is preferable that you buy from a Muslim shop, so that our money helps our own Muslim brother, even if he charges maybe 25 cents more, so that he gets a profit, so that the money circulates among the Muslims. So I agree with you, sister, that if we have a good hold on the Muslim community, but we should be careful that when we plan such strategies, we should be careful it should not backfire. It should not backfire. I mean, depending where you're living and which situation are you in. Other if it backfire, we'll be in the loss. So if it's done, it should be done with hikmah and husna. Backfiring means if you're a minority, minority, just, and if they start boycotting you, then you may have trouble, then you have to plan of a strategy with hikmah. Otherwise, I, I agree with your policy that Muslims should support Muslims. Hope that's the question. Yes, brother. This question was asked What is the Islamic perspective on Darwin's theory of evolution? The, what is our stand, basically, on that? The brother asked the question that what is the Islamic stance on Darwin's theory? <coughs> On Darwin's theory, theory of evolution, that human beings have been created from ape. Whether if you read the book of Origin of Species, Darwin traveled on a ship named HMS Beagle and went to an island by the name of Calatropus. And there he saw birds, birds, the finches, they pecked at holes. Depending upon the niche, the hole they pecked, the beak kept on becoming small and big. Based on this knowledge, Darwin said that I believe in the theory of evolution that one species can transform to the other. But he had no proof for that. In fact, he wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in the year 1861 that I don't believe in the theory of evolution because I've got proof, but because it helps me in classification of embryology, morphology, rudimentary organs. He had no proof for that. But unfortunately today, it is taught in the school as a fact. It's not a fact, it's a theory. Darwin's theory is just a hypothesis. There is no proof for that at all. I know there are vestiges, there are some fossils, that from that we can say that, okay, this, we have been evolved from ape. According to P.P. Grasse, in the year 1971, he held the chair of the evolutionary studies. In, in Paris. He said that we cannot decipher who were our ancestors just based on few vestiges. Vestiges mean fossils. And we know today there are four waves, if you know about the hominoids. There are four waves of hominoids. The first is Lucy. That's the first is Lucy Australopithecus, which came about three and a half million years ago and died by the Ice Age. The second wave what the Homo erectus, which died about 500,000 to 150,000 years ago. Third was the Neanderthal man, which died about 40,000 years ago. And last was the Cro-Magnon. See, the Quran says in Surah Nuh, chapter 71, verse number 14, that the human beings have been created in stages. But there is no proof that one hominoid has been transformed to the other. And there is no proof showing that we have been transformed from the human being. No proof at all. Where it comes to, do you believe in Darwin's theory? Some people say it's totally wrong, some people say it's totally right. We Muslims are in between. Today there is some proof on one species turning to another in the lower level, like amoeba. Nowhere does the Quran say that amoeba cannot transform into another species. But there is no proof at all at a higher level, at the animal level or at the level of the human beings. 
There's no proof at all. It's a hypothesis. But unfortunately, this hypothesis is taught in the schools and universities as a fact. No wonder we say that if we have to insult someone, we say that if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate he looks like an ape. There's no proof at all. There are missing links which Darwin himself said. It's just an assumption. So Alhamdulillah, Quran does not agree that we have been evolved from ape. The first set of human beings that came on the world was Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. There are researches being done to prove that. And some scientists say that yes, agree we have come from one pair. But yet it, ha it hasn't been testified yet. It's just under research. So Darwin's theory is an outdated theory. No scholar believes in it today. Only those who don't have uprooted knowledge will say it is right. It's an assumption. Maybe it may be true. But it's not a fact at all. So we don't have to test Quran with assumptions. If anyone wants to test the Quran is right or wrong, ask him to get any scientific fact and there is not a single verse of the Holy Quran which goes against scientific facts. Hope that answers the question. Yes. Yes, sister. Yes, one, gents, one ladies. One gents, one ladies. Yes, sister. Wa alaikum as salam. in the Holy Quran no less than eight times. Eight times it has been mentioned, the word riba. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 39, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161, and Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130, and Surah Al Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 275, thrice in that verse, and Surah Al Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 276, and in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278, and which you quoted rightly, the Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanatu qullah wa zaru ma baqi min ar -rimah. that oh you believe, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah and give up what remains of your demands of riba. Fa'illam taf'alu. And if you do it not, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. The Holy Quran says, if you indulge in riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Allah and His Rasul will wage jihad with you. And I do agree with your sister, who has the guts in the world to wage a war against Allah and His Rasul? Why is there a difference of opinion between the various scholars on riba? The reason is because those scholars who say, all the scholars agree riba is haram. All the scholars. No scholar says riba is halal. But the difference of opinion is, some scholars say, the modern day interest does not include riba. While others say, interest includes riba. 
Now to solve the different sisters, the complete answer you can refer to my video cassette, interest free economy promulgated by the Quran and I feel it's available for sale also here, interest free economy promulgated by the Quran and I've described in detail, not only to a Muslim from the Quran, I've even proved to a non-Muslim why interest is wrong. Proof to a non-Muslim that if you don't take interest, you will flourish in business. See, a non-Muslim won't agree in the Holy Quran. So what is the use of him telling that Allah will wage a war against you? He does not believe in the Quran. So a proof to a non-Muslim on economic terms, terms based on the banking level, the cash rates or reserve ratio, use their terminology to prove to them that interest will get you nowhere, it will bring you more loss. Now coming to your question on riba. The difference of opinion about riba. The actual meaning of the Arabic word riba means addition to, over and above the original amount. That's the meaning of riba. Now if you analyze, what is the meaning of interest in the Oxford Dictionary? Interest means amount paid for the use of amount lent. That means if you pay a certain amount of percentage for the use of money, that's interest. And usually is exorbitant interest. That means interest is smaller part of usury and usury is bigger portion of interest, according to Oxford Dictionary. Now, as I mentioned, riba means over and above the original amount. It does not say little or big. So irrespective whether it is little or big, both are haram. So riba includes both in modern interest of the banking as well as usury. It includes both and it's made haram for both. There are various arguments people can give. It means riba is talaq of business, not this riba. All these answers sisters have given in detail in my video cassette. Interest free economy promulgated by the Quran. So irrespective whether it is modern banking, anything which is a fixed amount, fixed amount of money paid for a use of fixed amount, it is haram. Then some people say, see, taking interest is haram. What about giving interest? That's allowed. See, the Quran clearly states, anyone who indulges in doesn't say paying interest or taking interest, both. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Tirmidhi and the other hadith, that anyone who takes interest, who gives interest, who's a middle party, and the person who records, all four will burn in hell. All four. So whether you take or give or be a witness or record it, if you're a witness for opening a saving account or a fixed deposit account, even you are involved in riba. All four types of people, it's prohibited. For detailed answers, you can refer to my video cassette. When they Sister asked a very good question. That's, that's a very good question. And this question was asked to me in that cassette and the answer is given there also. One person asked me the same question as sister asked that agreed. Giving riba is haram, taking riba is haram. So what we do, we'll take riba and we'll give it in charity. We will not take a single pie of it and we'll buy footwear, some people say. Some alim has given the fatwa that you can you can make toilets. Some say you can build toilets of the mosque. Some people give in charity, various fatwas, I'm not going to speak on that. What question I pose to these people who say that take riba, don't use it for self and give in charity. So I tell them that brother, I want to start a business, business in drug dealing, heroin and cocaine. I invest a hundred thousand dollars and every month I make a profit of two hundred thousand dollars. My hundred thousand I get back and two hundred thousand dollars every month I make. So I ask him the question that see. I know dealing with drugs is haram. The profit I get out of it, I don't spend even a single cent on my cent, on myself. I give the full two hundred thousand dollars in charity to orphans and to make toilets and to buy footwear. Is it allowed? He said, No, it is haram. I said, Why? Because drug is haram. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran. I said, See, Holy Quran says alcohol and drug. Ya yuhallazina amanu, Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 90. Ya yuhallazina amanu, innam al-khamru al-maithuru. Most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Wal anzabu al-aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, wisdom min amali shaitan. These are certain handiwork. First tanibu ula lukum tuflihun. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. The Quran says alcohol is prohibited. But Quran does not say if you deal in drugs, Allah will wage a war against you. So interest is a bigger haram. 
So when you can't, when you can't allow me to do, to do, to do dealing in drugs and give my profit in charity, then how can you take interest and give the profit in charity? I'm doing a smaller crime. And the Islamic state has said, if you have option between the two, smaller is better than bigger. So I'm doing a smaller crime and I'm giving in charity. So when you say this is haram, then I say a bigger crime is a bigger haram. So surely I don't agree with that philosophy that take money and give it in charity. The philosophy is you're encouraging the system, don't involve in interest at all. People say, how will we keep our money safe? I say, put in an Islamic bank. If there's no Islamic bank, put in a current account. Current account which does not deal with interest. And see to it that you don't put too much money in current account also. Why simply let him have it? Do business, do tijarat, earn profit and loss sharing. And how to do that? I have explained my cassette, interest pay economy per Quran. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. One more question from sister and then we're going to be ready for brain maghrib and then we'll continue inshallah. One more question only from the sister. Inshallah. If you all want to ask question, I am willing. It's my pleasure. Wa alaikum as -salam. My question is regarding small children, boys and girls, engaging in playful activities. I would like to know, Islamically, boys and girls ranging from the age of four and five be taught that they should not play with... The sister has posed the question that young boys and girls, young children at the age of four to five, when they play with each other, should we bring a prohibition? Is it right or is it wrong, etc.? Sister, I wouldn't say that it is haram as such, because the Holy Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 30, that do hijab with so and so people, except those extreme of ages. So it gives permission that among the young children you can. But that does not mean that you should encourage. I wouldn't say it is haram. If someone is doing, I won't say it is haram, but you're encouraging them. Because what a child learns in the childhood, he he adopts the same thing when he grows up. But the moment they become mature, then it becomes haram. The moment a child becomes elder, 14, 15, etc., it becomes haram. They cannot play with each other. Girls and boys can't intermingle unless they are mahram. Brothers and sisters can. Brothers and sisters, mother and daughter, whatever it is, can. So I would say it is not good to encourage the Muslim children to play with the opposite sex of a nahmahram. You teach them good values from the beginning and they will keep that values. Similar with hijab. A small girl of the age of four, she need not do hijab. But if you encourage from the beginning, daughter, wear a scarf, at least if not 100% time, at least 50% of the time, then make it 75%. If you start teaching her from the age of eight, nine to wear skirt and mini, and when she becomes a little bit older, saying, okay, now it's haram for you. Stop it. A direct change is difficult, sister. So you should teach the children from childhood, from day one. Similarly, with all the other aspects, inculcate the Islamic values. Like when the children play, instead of playing the modern games, like Monopoly, how they teach you to earn money, earn money and make you a businessman. Let them play the Islamic version which is produced in UK, the Steps to Paradise, and I feel it's available here. That they try and earn sawab. It makes them a better Muslim, not a better businessman or a businesswoman. So encourage your children from the childhood about Islamic ethics and values. I wouldn't say it is haram. I would say encourage them to wear the hijab, the girls. Let them not intermingle freely with the other people. Brothers and sisters are fine so that they grow up to be good Muslims. Hope that answers the question, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If there are any pending questions on Islam and compared to religion or the propagation of, of Islam, you're most welcome. Yes, brother. You were saying that Islam, dunya and secularism are incorporated into Islam. It's part of Islam. My question is, when you say this is not because we do anything, but when we do anything, because we do anything, because we do anything, because we do Outside of the realm of Allah or Islam, does it become a system incorporated into Islam when you said Bismillah? Brother asked a question that is, Dunya part of Islam, yes it is. And the second question you posed when you said Bismillah, Rahman goes out of Islam. You said Bismillah hmm. before, we, before we go to our wives, before we eat, before we do anything. Hmm. Bismillah. Is that, is that still secular after you say Bismillah? 
Allah. Brother asked the question that when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, is that secular or not? That's what if you heard my talk, brother, I made very clear that Islam tolerates secularism. One of the definitions of secularism is dealing with worldly affairs. And Islam says you should deal with worldly affairs. Second definition of secularism is that anything which is non-monastic. Islam is non-monastic. Now secularism says that it is against sacred things, against religion. So secularism cannot tolerate Islam. Islam can tolerate secularism. So Islam, when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Islam tolerates it. But secularism does not tolerate Islam. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Wa alaikum salam. Just the issue about secularism. Uh, I mean, it's just a matter of semantics. If it's secularism, you can say it yourself. The way that secularism is understood, okay? Very different ways. It's understood is that there's a separation between Allah, okay, and, you know, what happens in this world. That's what secularism is. So therefore, it totally conflicts with Islam. So, I mean, it's semantical, so you can't really say that Islam accepts secularism, okay? Because Islam has its own hukum, okay? Allah SWT has given us, like you said, in a way of life, hukum for every aspect of our life. In that way, it incorporates dunya, but it doesn't incorporate secularism. Brother asked the question that does secularism completely go against Islam, etc. I told very clearly in my talk, brother, if you heard my talk, I gave the definition of the Oxford Dictionary. And I gave other definitions, various. Everyone has his own definition of secularism. So I took the definition of Oxford Dictionary and proved to you that if secular means to do with worldly affairs, Islam is the most secular religion. I mean, my talk was very clear. I don't know where the confusion lies. But secularism does not tolerate Islam. Secularism says anything which is sacred, we don't have anything to do with it. We don't have anything to do with God. So we don't, we, alhamdulillah, the other parts of secularism, we tolerate it. They don't tolerate Islam. Hope that it's a very clear cut statement that I made. Yes, sister. I pose the question, what is the meaning of Islamic secularism? I mean, there are people who say that we are secular in world commerce, and I give certain example in my talk that some people prove by saying that Islam is secular and say, Lakum dinukum waliyaddin. That means to use your way to me is mine. That means you can follow what you want, we can follow what we want. So that answer I gave in my talk, sister, saying that those who call those themselves secular in world commerce, they are pseudo, they are nothing like Islamic secularism. Islam is secular. But they try and twist the message to fit into the context of the non-Muslims. And they say, Islam says, La ikhraf al-deen. There is no compulsion religion. But they don't complete the quotation. The complete quotation says, there is no compulsion religion, but truth stands out clear from error. So the moment you say there is no compulsion, I do agree you cannot force anyone at the point of the sword or at the point of the gun. But when you say that there is no compulsion, you should also say, truth stands out clear from error. When you say that to you is your way, to me is mine, before that you have to say that, oh, those who reject faith. The question of rejection only arises when you present the truth. So those who say Islamic secularism and they try and twist the words of the Holy Quran, they are not following the Holy Quran. If you follow the Quran as a whole, you, you can't just take out one verse of the Quran and throw it on his face and say this is Islam. You as, we as Muslims should follow the whole Quran and Islam itself is sufficient. You don't have to add anything to Islam to make it better. Allah SWT says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3 On this day have I perfected my religion for you and I have chosen for you Islam and I have completed my favor on you. This religion is complete, you can't add anything more and take it out. It's the perfect way of life. There are people who try and twist verses of the Quran and make it more acceptable to the people. This itself is the best way of life and it should be the most acceptable. Hope that answers the question. Uh, I'm not sure. First question when I asked you about which religion says that the books in the books which are written about around the world. I I got your answer. What I actually I wanted a question like basically on born again Christians in their what is their belief? I've been dealing with born again Christians and I see that it's 
they don't believe in capitalism system. So anyway, you can't talk to them about class is explained. So in that context, I would, I would, I would repeat the question like deep into born again. The brother asked a question regarding born again Christians. There is a new sect which has evolved in the Christian realm, born again.